Hello, everybody. This is Paul Neeson with Torah Life Ministries. Thank you for joining me. We are reading the scriptures uh, today, as we do every day. And right now, we're going to be reading. Uh, we're going to be reading First uh, Samuel fourteen. First Samuel fourteen. So, if you want to join us, uh, you can open up there now. If you're watching on the replay, uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, we're here every morning at five thirty during the week. And uh, during the weekend, we're here a little bit later. And uh, you know, it's so important to read the word and get in the word every day. Let's open up in prayer with the Shema found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Kevo, Mahutov, Leolam Va'ed. Hero Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire, and when you arise. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontless between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Amen. Amen. So we are reading this uh, 14th chapter, continuing to see uh, the first king of Israel, Saul, and his son, Jonathan, and seeing the situation they're getting themselves in. And it's not a good situation, but this was the plan of Yahweh. Uh, the people asked for a king, and that wasn't Yahweh's will but that's what the plan wanted so yahweh in his plan of who that king would be gave them uh gave them saul to be that first king so uh, samuel anoints saul and here we are in chapter 14 it's a uh, it's a it's a good sized chapter so we're going to be reading it so a uh, good amount of notes so get ready uh to be reading this and and here we go one day, Jonathan said to his armor barrier, Come, let's go over uh, where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. And the note says, Why would Jonathan go alone to attack the Philistines? Jonathan may have been weary of the long, hopeless standoff in the battle. He trusted Yahweh to give him victory and wanted to act on that trust. He also knew that the number of Philistines was no problem for Yahweh. Perhaps he didn't tell his father about th this mission because he thought Saul would not let him go. Now, this commentary and all commentary I give is just commentary. It's what ifs, possibilities, and could be's. Do not take that for, well, this is what it meant 100%. They're ideas. And uh, this translation, which I'm reading most of the commentary about, is the New Living Translation. I also read the commentary out of my other translations that I read, the One New Man Bible, and also uh, the Hebraic Root Scriptures. And if something else comes up, I'll read it out of that as well. Uh, but uh, this, the authors here are suggesting this is why he went alone. Now, let's give you my opinion why he went alone. So he already has his dad taking credit for his victories. Uh, and he already has his dad making uh, major mistakes uh, in, in terms of Yah's plan and what Yahweh should be doing. Yahweh's already doomed him uh, pretty much uh, for what he's done. And uh, so Jonathan sees all this and knows what's going on. Uh, but, you know, he, he said, I'm going to go there without my dad. I'm going to go there and, get, and take care of this and do this. And let's see what happens here. It says in verse 2, Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped on the outskirts of uh, uh, Geba, Geba, around the pomegranate tree at uh, Migron. Now, remember this too. They didn't have cell phones in those days. Hey, where are you at? They had runners, people that went back and forth and might have given them a message or something. And uh, so they didn't have immediate communication as well. Perhaps... Uh, Saul, uh, 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 Jonathan was ready to go, but uh, you know, he didn't want to wait for that message to get there. Several reasons or possibilities, uh, but let's see. So he's under this uh pomegranate tree, and it says, Among Saul's men was 
Uh, hey, Aja, the priest who was wearing the ephod and the priestly vest. Ahab was the son of Echabod's brother, Abtub, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of Yahweh, who had served at Shiloh. No one realized that Jonathan had left the Israelite camp to reach the Philistine outpost. Jonathan uh, had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Boaz and Senak. The cliff on the north was front uh, in front of uh, Machmash, and the one on the south was in front of Geba. Let's go across the outpost of those uh, uh, of those pagans, Jonathan said uh, to his armor barrier. Perhaps Yahweh will help. Perhaps Yahweh will help. Uh, the notice said Jonathan and his armor barrier weren't much uh, uh, of a force to attack a huge Philistine army. But while everyone else was afraid, they trusted Yahweh knowing that the size of the enemy would not restrict Yahweh's ability to help them. Yahweh honored their faith and brave action, uh, these two men, with a tremendous victory. Have you ever felt surrounded by the enemy or faced overwhelming, overwhelming odds? Yahweh is never... Uh, intimidated by the state of the enemy or the complexity of a problem. With him, there are always enough resources to resist the pressures and win the battle. If Yahweh has called you to action, then bravely commit what resources you have uh, to Yahweh and rely upon him to lead you to victory. Amen. Amen. And there's a little uh, uh, picture here or a map showing uh, Jonathan where he went and exactly how he got into the camp and what exactly uh, he did. And continuing verse 6, it says, Nothing can hinder, hinder Yahweh. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. Hence the scripture, uh, we can do all things through him who strengthens us. And that's what Jonathan is pretty much a suggestion here and saying just showing tremendous faith and it says so that would answer the real question why in the world would he go to battle alone well uh maybe i told him to go uh so it says in verse seven do you want to think do what you think is best the armor bearer replied i'm with you completely whatever you decide to have a faithful uh com com companion or a faithful uh person on your team is uh it's a wonderful thing and 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 he, his man here had his armor barrier had it had whatever he said i'll do it i'm with you and uh, all right then jonathan told him we will cross over and let them see us if they say to us stay where you are or we'll kill you then we will stop and not go up but if they say come up and fight then we will go up and that uh, then we will go up that will be Yahweh's sign that he will help us defeat them. When the Philistines saw them coming, they shouted, Look, the Hebrews, uh, the Hebrew are crawling out of their holes. Then the men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan, Come up here and we'll teach you a lesson. Come on, climb right behind me, Jonathan said to his arm barrier, for Yahweh will help us defeat them. So they climbed up using both hands and feet, and the Philistines fell before Jonathan, and his uh, armor barrier killed those who came behind them. They killed some 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered over about a half an acre. Suddenly, panic broke out in the Philistine army, both in the camp and in the field, including even the outpost of the raiding party and the raiding parties. And just then, the earthquake struck. An earthquake struck, and everyone was terrified. And there's uh, this note here for verse 12. And verse 12 was the verse that said, so they climbed in both hands and feet, and, and they struck and killed them. So verse 12 goes on to say, Jonathan did not have authority to lead all the troops into battle, but he could start a small, 
skirmish in one corner of the enemy camp. When he did, uh, panic broke out among the Philistines. The, uh, like Hebrews who had been drafted into the Philistine army, revolted, and the men who were hiding in the hills uh, regained their surge and returned to fight. When you are facing a difficult situation that is beyond your control, ask yourself, what steps can I take now to work towards a solution? A few small steps uh, may be just what is needed to begin the chain of events to lead to eventual, uh, eventual victory. So, we find ourselves here in, in uh, the Israel going up against the Philistines, and now we're going to see the panic that broke out uh, was the beginning of the defeat uh, Israel has over the Philistines. And we look at verse uh, 16 here. Saul, look, uh, Saul looked out in a gay beam of Benjamin uh, and saw a strange sight. The vast army of the Philistines began to melt away in every direction. Call the roll and find out who's missing, Saul ordered. And when they checked, they found that Jonathan and his army barrier were gone. Then Saul shouted to a AJ, bring the ephod here. For at that time, uh, AJ was wearing the ephod in front of the Israelites. Now the ephod was something that was in the priestly vest to, to tell the uh, Israelites uh, what Yahweh wanted. It, often it gave a yes or no reply. Uh, um, it says, but while Saul was, Saul was talking to the priest, the confusion in the Philistine camp grew louder and louder. So Saul said to the priest, never mind, let's get going. Then, uh, well, so now there's a note here. It says, let's get going it refers to the use uh, of the arm and thimmon. These small objects were withdrawn from the uh, linen ephod worn by the priest and used to determine Yahweh's will. We discussed that. It was, uh, so not the ephod, but the ermin and thurbim, which was like two little stones. Uh, Saul was rushing uh, to the uh, formalities of getting the answer from Yahweh so he could hurry and get into battle to take advantage of the confusion of the Philistines. So verse 20, then Saul and all his men rushed to battle and, uh, and found the Philistines uh, killing each other. There was a terrible confusion everywhere. Even the Hebrews who had previously gone over to the Philistines' army revolted and joined in with Saul, Jonathan, and the rest of the Israelites. Likewise, the men of Israel who were hiding in the hill country of Ephraim joined the chase when they saw the Philistines running away. So Yahweh saved Israel that day, and the battle continued to rage even beyond uh, Beth Avon. Now we're going to look at uh, Saul's foolish oath here in uh, verse 24 and continue reading. So it says, Now the men of Israel were oppressed to exhaustion that day because Saul had placed them under an oath saying, Let's curse, let a curse fall on anyone who eats before evening, before I have a full revenge on my enemies. So no one ate anything that day, even though they had found the honeycomb on the ground. In the forest, they didn't dare touch the honeycomb because they all fear the oath that had been taken. And we remember this oath. It says, Saul made an oath without thinking uh, through uh, the implications. The result, number one, his men were too uh, tired to fight. Number two, they were hungry. Uh, and they ate a meal uh, that still... They were so hungry that they ate a meal that still consisted of bl contained blood, which was against Yahweh's law. And number three, Saul almost killed his own son. Saul's impulsive oath. oath. And remember, every impulsive oath into the scripture up to this point uh, did not turn out good. It says, uh, Saul's impulsive oath sounded heroic, but if it had, it had disastrous side effects. If you are in the middle of a conflict, Guard against impulsive statements that you may be forced to honor. 
Verse 27, but Jonathan had not heard the father's command. He dipped the end of his uh, stick into a piece of honeycomb and ate the honeycomb. After uh, he had eaten it, he felt refreshed. But one of the men saw him and said, your father made an army uh, take a strict oath that anyone who eats from this today will be cursed. That is why everyone is weary and faint. And Jonathan replies, my father made uh, trouble for all of us, Jonathan exclaimed. A command like that only hurts us. See how refreshed I am now and that I've eaten this little bit of honey. If the men had been allowed to eat freely from the food uh, they found among the enemies, think how much more the Philistines we could have uh, killed. They chased and killed the Philistines all day from Mikmash to uh, Agilon, growing more and more faint. That every that evening they rushed for uh, uh, the battle plan plunder and butchered the sheep, goats, and cattle and calves. Uh, but they ate them without draining the blood. And that is a, a big no-no, a big problem, uh, according to Scripture. We're going to see that someone reported to Saul, look, the men are sinning against Yahweh by eating meat that still has blood in it. That is very wrong, Saul said. Find a large stone and roll it over here. So let's take a look at what they've done uh, real quick here and, and discuss that. It says, one of the oldest and strongest Hebrew food uh, commandments was the prohibition against eating meat containing the animal's blood, as found in Leviticus 7.26 and 27. This command began, uh, began in Noah's day in Genesis 9.4 and was still observed by the early Christians. And we see that in Acts 15, 27 to 29. It was wrong to eat blood because blood representing life and life belonged to Yahweh. So they, they did this terrible sin here uh, of eating these animals. They had the honey to eat, but they were too uh, scared of the, of the oath they took and they didn't want to be cursed. But then they went ahead and go and sinned against Yah. Uh, they were more worried about the curse of breaking the oath of uh, of Saul than they were about uh, breaking the commandment of Yahweh and uh, <clears throat> that just shows you where their disobedience was or who their or who they were looking up to more and who where their faith was and who was with and who wasn't it says then Saul built an altar to Yahweh it was the first of the altars he built to Yahweh verse 36 then Saul said let's chase the Philistines all night and plunder them until sunrise let's destroy every last one of them his men replies we'll do whatever you think is best but the priest said uh, let's go uh, let uh, let's ask yahweh first so uh, the note here says after being uh, king for several years saul finally built his first altar to yahweh but only as a last resort Throughout Saul's region, he consistently approached Yahweh only after he had tried everything else. This was in sharp contrast to the priest who suggested that Yahweh be consulted first. How much better if Saul, uh, Saul had gone to Yahweh first, building an altar at his le uh, and his, as his first official act as king. Yahweh is too great. Uh, to be an afterthought. When we turn to him first, we will never have to turn to him uh, as a last resort. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, so keep this in mind. And that's what one of the points of reading is. Because I tell people and explain, every book in the scripture has a meaning. That, But if you really want to understand the scriptures, all you need to read is the, and this is my opinion and my, my understanding of this, all you need to read is the Torah, the Gospels, and Revelation. That right there will give you every single fact you need about Scripture and everything in between, the book of the prophets, the writings of Paul, and the Proverbs, some, everything in between are excellent for us to learn from other people's mistakes so we don't get ourselves in the same situation. And it gives us information to support what's found in the Torah, the prophets, and Revelation. So uh, as we continue, uh, Reading here, uh, verse 36. 
Uh, so we said, he said, let's chase them all night. Let's take their blood and destroy every last one of them. His memory replied, we'll do whatever you want. The priest said, let's ask Yahweh first. 37, so Saul asked Yahweh, should we go after the Philistines? Will you help us defeat them? But Yahweh made no reply that day. So Yahweh didn't reply. Uh, he didn't give his information. And if Samuel was being obedient, he would have waited. He, uh, after all, he asked, or, or Saul. Saul would have waited after all the acts. It says, Then Saul said to the leaders, Something's wrong. I want all my army to commanders to come here. We must find out what sin was committed today. I vow by the name of Yahweh who uh, rescued Israel that the sinner will surely die, even if it's my own son Jonathan. But no one would tell him what the trouble was. And then we see here in verse 39, the note, it says, this is the second of Saul's foolish vows. Saul made the first one to his, uh, of his two oaths uh, because he was over anxious to defeat the Philistines and wanted to give his soldiers an incentive to finish the battle quickly. In the Bible, Yahweh never asked the people to make oaths or vows, but if they did, he expected them to keep them. Saul's vow was not something Yahweh would have condoned. But still, it was an oath. And Jonathan, although he did not know about Saul's oath, was never the less guilty of breaking it. Like Jephthah, Saul made an oath that risked the life of his own child. Fortunately, the people intervened and spared Jonathan's life. Saul had issued a ridiculous command and had driven his men to sin. But, sti but still, he would, uh, wouldn't back down even if he had to kill his son. When we make ridiculous statements, it is too difficult to admit we are wrong. Sticking to the story just to save face only compounds the problem. It takes more courage to admit a mistake uh, than to hold resolutely to an error. So... Then verse 40, then Saul said, Jonathan, I will stand over here and all of you stand over there. And the people responded to Saul, whatever you think is best in 41. And then Saul prayed, oh, Yahweh of Israel, please show us who is guilty and who is innocent. Then they uh, can't uh, cast sacred lots. And Jonathan and Saul were chosen as the guilty ones. And the people were declared innocent. Then Saul said, now cast lots again and choose between me and Jonathan. And Jonathan was shown to be a guilty one. Tell me what you have done, Saul demanded Jonathan. And he said, I tasted a little honey, Jonathan admitted. It was only a little bit uh, on the end of my stick. Does that deserve death? Yes, Jonathan, Saul said. You must die. May Yahweh strike me and even kill me if you don't die for this. So even though it was a little oath, and some people might say, well, why would he take an oath seriously? Because it says in the scriptures, do not make an oath you're not going to keep. This is why people were to take their oath seriously. And these are oaths to Yahweh uh, and other people as well. Uh, if, if Yahweh was involved, if you were making this oath to Yahweh, not to other people, but to Yahweh. But you could be saying it to other people, but it says in front of other people, but it's all about Yah. That's what the whole idea of the oath was. And, and, and Saul said, yes, my son, this is worth death. Verse 45. But the people broke in and said to Saul, Jonathan has won his great victory for Israel. Should he die? Far from it. As surely as Yahweh lives, not one hair on his head will be touched. For Yahweh helped him to do a great deed today. So the people rescued Jonathan and he was not put to death. Wow, you talk about having people behind you. And then it says in verse 46, Then Saul called back the army from chasing the Philistines, and the Philistines returned home. Now when Saul had secured his grasp on Israel's throne, he fought against his enemies in every direction, against Moab, Ammon, Imam, and the kings of Zobah and the Philistines. And whenever he turned, he, wherever he turned, he was victorious. He performed great deeds and conquered the uh, Amalekites, saving Israel from all those who had plundered them. So Saul is, is, is showing uh, the, the, his victorious 
stance and, and, and everything he did. And uh, we look at some uh, note here. It says, Jonathan's spiritual, uh, Jonathan's spiritual character was in striking contrast to, to Saul's. Jonathan admitted to what he had done. He did not try to make excuses, even though he was unaware of Saul's oath. Jonathan was willing to accept the consequence of his actions. When you do wrong, even unintentionally, respond like Jonathan, not like Saul. And then it says here in verses 44 and 45, Saul made another foolish statement, this time because he was more concerned about saving face than, uh, than being right. To spare Jonathan's life would uh, required to him to admit that he had acted foolishly an embarrassment for a king. Saul was really more interested in protecting the image and forcing his vow. Fortunately, the people came to Jonathan's rescue. Don't be like Saul. Admit your mistakes and show that you are more in interested in doing what is right than what is looking good. And now we look at Saul's military success. It says in verse 47, Now when Saul had secure, secured the gasp of Israel's throne, he fought against his enemies in every direction, against Moab, Edom, and the kings of Zobab and the Philistines, and wherever he turned, he was victorious. And it also says, Why was Saul so successful right after he had disobeyed Yahweh and had been told that his region would not Uh, his region would end, or they would not last. Sometimes ungodly people win battles. Victories is never guaranteed, nor limited to the righteousness, or to the righteous. Yahweh provides according to his will. Yahweh might have given uh, Saul success for the sake of the people, not for Saul. He may have left uh, Saul on the throne, uh, for a while, to utilize his military talents, so that David, uh, so uh, so that David, Israel's next king, could spend more time focusing on the nation's spiritual battles. Regardless of Yahweh's reasons for delaying Saul's demise, uh, his reign ended exactly the way Yahweh had foretold. The timing of Yahweh's plans and promises is known only to Him. Our task is to commit our ways to Yahweh. And then trust him uh, to uh, for the outcome. Hallelujah! And doing that without fear, trust is trust. Trust isn't uh, isn't something that I'm going to do and not uh, have faith. So you might have uh, curiosity about a situation, uh, but to have anxiety or something about it is, is not putting your full trust in Yahweh. So verse uh, forty nine. Saul's son, including Jonathan, uh, Ishkabeth, and uh, uh, Melchabesh, he also had two daughters, uh, Miram, who was older, and uh, uh, Michal. Uh, Saul's wife was uh, Anuam, the daughter of uh, Ammonese. The commander of Saul's army was Abner, the son of Saul's uncle, Net. Saul's father, Kish, and Abner's father, Net, were both sons of Abit. And again, it gives their family reason, line and, and who was in the family and everything else. And it said this family is going to, uh, previously that they'd be destroyed because of, or never be kings again. This is what Saul has done. In verse 52, the Israelites fought consistently with the Philistines throughout Saul's lifetime. So whenever Saul observed uh, a young man who was brave and strong, he drafted him into his army. So uh, we'll see here another defeat at where Saul defeats the Amalekites in the next sentence, in the next chapter. Uh, but that's where put, that's where we are today uh, with uh, with all this. And uh, you see, when uh, Yahweh had uh, violence all throughout uh, this kingdom or or, the, or this kingship, uh, and it wasn't a, a peaceful time. And uh, all all of Saul's kingdom, he was at war. Uh, it was never settled. And uh, it's said in the scriptures, just like it did with Solomon, I will bring a time of peace. I will give you peace throughout your kingdom. So we, we go here to Deuteronomy. Uh, well, let's go look at the close in Numbers 6, 24, 26. 
with your ironic benediction. Yerifkaka, Yahweh, Yerish Merikaka, Yo Air, Yahweh, Panana, Alaka, Vikonika, Yo see Yahweh, Panana, Alaka, Yosem, Aka, Shalom. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his contents and give you peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Remember, as believers, we need to pray, praise, proclaim, read, and repent, submit. Uh, pray every morning uh, and, and every day. Keep speaking to Yah. Uh, praise him. Give song to him. Sing to his song. It says in 1 Chronicles 16, 23, sing to Yahweh all the earth and pray and, 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 and proclaim the news from day to day of his salvation of Yeshua. Hallelujah. Proclaim. Going out there and proclaiming it, whether it's with a sign in a corner or speaking to people or doing a post on the internet, go out there and proclaim the word. Pray, praise, proclaim. Read, reading your word daily. Reading the words are not just a Bible or a book, it's, a, it's the holy Bible of words in the will of our Creator. Pray, praise, proclaim. Read and repent. Repentance brings refreshing, the Bible says. Admitting your mistakes and, and changing and turning your mind to go in a direction towards Yah. In his plan and no longer seeking our own plan. And then finally, pray, pray, proclaim, read, and repent, and submit, submitting to him. The most submissive person in all scripture is Yeshua. And uh, we see uh, we need to submit to our creator's will and let our will be done until our will turns to his will. Hallelujah. Uh, thank you for joining us every morning. Have a blessed day. Please share this with others. And if you're joining us for the first time, you can go to the YouTube page or on the YouTube page, Torah Life Ministries. Just subscribe at the top. And uh, when you uh, click that bell, and then you'll be notified when I'm starting. All right. Until then, everybody, have a blessed day. Thank you, and shalom, shalom.